Welcome to Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany when we will ascend to a mountaintop. It's the, it's the last Sunday before the beginning of Lent, which begins on Wednesday. And I'd like you to consider doing something special for Lent. Um, one idea is that, um, to use the Lenten devotional that we can mail to you. If you call or, or email the church office, we can send it out to you on Tuesday. Another idea is to participate in an evening Bible study that I'll be offering on Wednesday evenings for five Wednesday evenings during the season of Lent. They'll be on Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. starting February 24th and ending March 24th. Please do let me know if you're interested in participating in that special Bible story. And now I would like to call you to worship by paraphrasing the words of Henry Nouwen. At some moments, we experience complete unity within and without. It may happen when we stand on a mountaintop, captivated by the view. It may happen when we witness the birth of a child or sit at the edge of the ocean, contemplating eternity. It may happen during worship or in a quiet room during prayer. But whenever and however it happens, we say to ourselves, this is it. Everything fits. All I ever hoped for is here. It happened to Peter, James, and John when they saw the glory of the Lord. As you worship God today, may you remember how it's happened for you. Please join me and Lina in singing our opening song of praise, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Right. 
Please pray with me. God of grace, you have blessed us with minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading for this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8, verses 34, through chapter 9, verse 8. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The second reading is from... Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slave, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds upon the scriptures be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When my children were younger, I took them over the course of many summers to vacation in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, we, we, um, we rented a large Victorian house with a group of friends that was located right across the street from the beach and the boardwalk. And one year, on the last, of, the last day of 14 days at the beach, I arose early, I bought myself a cup of coffee, 
and I sat down in the sand by the edge of the water to stare at the waves. Outside of the vacation time, my life was busy with work and caring for my children and all of the other things that are packed into our lives that we need to attend to on a daily, a weekly, a monthly, and even an annual basis. But I sat in the sand and I watched wave roll in upon wave and I felt that it was all I ever wanted or needed to do. I imagine that you've had moments like that too, what Henry Nouwen calls the experience of the fullness of time. We are told, and I believe it to be true, that those moments nourish us. They give us something to live on. They fuel us for the living of our days, the doing of our errands, and the reaching out in love toward others. But as much as we may want to stay in those moments forever, to remain in that state of mind for all eternity, it seems there's always something tugging at us and pulling us away. And many a sermon has been written for Transfiguration Sunday about the work that awaits us back down in the valley, and how we serve God by getting down there and getting on with it. Peter himself is often taken to task for wanting to pitch tents on the mountaintop, to freeze Elijah, Moses, and Jesus in that moment of glory instead of getting down there and getting on with it. But today, I want to suggest instead that we don't try to force or preserve an experience of the fullness of time, but we do try to relax into it, to let it be. As you may have experienced, the minute you try to control a mountaintop experience, it slips away. Almost the moment you sometimes realize you're having it, it disappears. When I began studying the story for this week, the story about Jesus' face transfigured, his clothes whitened, and Moses and Elijah returned from the dead, I wondered how any of us could relate to it. I posed these questions. What's in it for us? What can I give to my congregation from this text? What word is in it for us? And the text began to slip away from me. You almost had a sermon about listening. I was going to ask you to think about who you listen to, because not only does Jesus appear transfigured, but we hear God's voice coming in loud and clear. This is my son the beloved, listen to him. I think some of us listen to our parents, some of us maybe listen to them more than we should, others maybe not as much as we should. My own mother has been dead for 40 years, but I still try to listen to the things she told me about what is important and what isn't important. And sometimes when I most need her, it even feels like she stops in for a little visit and I can feel her presence with me in a way that feels like more than me simply remembering her. Moses and Elijah showed up for Jesus in a way that was more than just him simply remembering them. Maybe he needed a little visit from those who knew what it was like to serve God so faithfully. We know Moses and Elijah had experiences very much like the ones that Jesus had. They too had both suffered for God. Their glory too was intertwined with that suffering. 
At times, they too were lonely because of their faithfulness to God, the fierce conflict with the powerful authorities of their day. Their lives were placed in danger, put on the line for serving God too. Peter sees Jesus transfigured before him, sees Jesus talking to Elijah and Moses, and Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. I think it is good for us to be here where not everything makes sense, not everything can be explained, and it doesn't have to be. What is there about sitting on the beach on a summer morning with a cup of coffee watching the waves while my children slept that transformed it into an experience of the fullness of time? I don't know. What is it about reading the Bible or hearing it read aloud that transforms it into the Word of God? I don't know. On the beach that morning, I wasn't thinking anything particularly profound. I hadn't accomplished anything noteworthy. I had no earth-shattering breakthrough. But when I first approached this text, I wanted to wring from it something to give you, a talisman maybe, to store in your pocket and take with you to guard off evil wherever you encountered it. A word, of, a word from God, from the word of God, that did something good for you in your life, made it better, richer, more meaningful, and sweeter. But I realized the best thing I can offer you is the thing I can't give you because it isn't a thing, it's an experience, an experience of the fullness of time. In many sermons, ministers have criticized Peter for his response to his mountaintop experience. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Mark tells us he didn't know what to say because he and James and John were terrified. Peter didn't know what was happening, so he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do, so he offered something useful. We do that sometimes. When we are awed, transported, experiencing what seems to be a terrifying level of awareness, we might quickly switch back to what feels mundane and safer. Peter wanted to do something practical, the way I wanted to wring some useful word from this text. We can push away an experience of the fullness of time because it can terrify us. We can rush to do something, anything, to bring ourselves back down to sea level, reassert our control over the situation. We can be in too big a hurry to reinforce our illusion that we can keep things orderly and familiar. But we can also choose to relax into the experience of the unknown and say with Peter, it is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be flabbergasted, to not understand, to be surprised, to be awed, and even to be scared. God said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. God said, this is no ordinary man. He didn't come to confirm your preconceived notions. 
He won't remain within the limits of whatever boundaries you have placed around him. He will rock your world. He will confound you. He will challenge you. He will even terrify you. Listen to him. But first, be amazed. See his glory. Be nourished by how glorious he is. And see how it's nothing like what we thought glory was. It's not privilege. It's not winning. It's not exerting power over others. It's not manipulating others with lies into doing one's dirty work for one. It's denying ourselves. It's losing our lives. It's taking up our crosses. It's awesome. This, this glory that is the glory of Jesus, it's good that we are here experiencing it. It's good that this true glory exists and shines brightly among us, countering the false glory of those in our country and around the world who cling to power and even lust after it at the high cost of human lives, not their own. The glorified Jesus said, take up your cross. Jesus taught them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the authorities. Six days later, Jesus led Peter, James, and John up a mountain. It all took place within the same week. The acknowledgement of his suffering, the acknowledgement of our suffering as his followers, and the revelation of his glory. But it is good for us to rest here this week on the mountaintop where those who have suffered for obeying God, those who have been lonely in following God, and those who overcome evil with good are glorified. It is good for us to pause here this week to be reminded of what glory is and what glory isn't. Glory belongs to those who serve others. Glory belongs to the Capitol Police officers who were crushed in doorways, beaten with poles, injured, and even killed, protecting our elected representatives from beatings and assassinations. Experiences of the fullness of time, like those peaceful moments on the Cape May beach, sipping coffee, watching the waves, are always spiritually indebted to the sacrifices of self and ego, power and lust that have been made on my behalf and on yours. Savor these spiritually uplifting experiences. Rest in them. Relax into them. Stay a while. And clearly see the glory of the sacrifices that make them possible. Amen.
please take this time to be in a posture and a mindset of prayer and to pray along with me and those in our congregation who are joining us through um, this video. Let us pray. Holy and loving one, we take this time to pause, to rest in your presence, to relax into the embrace of your everlasting arms, and to bring into our mind's eye a picture of you in all your glory. May glory, honor, and praise be forever yours. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. We confess that we have sinned in glorifying that which is neither holy nor loving. We know that you stand ready to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we trust you to do that now. We ask you to cleanse our country of lies and falsehoods. We thank you for those who stand by their principles, who choose to do the right thing when it costs dearly, and who know that true glory is found in service to what is greater and better than themselves. We ask you to expose those who wrongly glorify themselves and to glorify those who have been wrongly shamed and condemned. We ask that those who have been lied to, misled and fooled, have the scales drop from their eyes. We ask you to rescue those suffering from domestic violence at the hands of those who glorify power and control. Bring the abused to safe places. We ask you to bless those who work tirelessly to provide safety of all kinds for others. Bless social workers, police officers, firefighters, healthcare workers, personnel at homeless and domestic violence shelters, we ask you to be with the injured Capitol Police officers, their families, and their loved ones. We pray a special blessing on all those who love the officers who have died through violent attacks and by suicide. May all who are still processing the horrifying and traumatic events of January 6 find the help and the comfort they need. Bless them with peace. Give them rest at night and joy in the morning light. Give to them, once again, experiences of the fullness of time in the fullness of time. We thank you, Lord, for all the vaccines that have been distributed throughout the world. We thank you for those who work close to home and at remote places of the globe. We thank you for all who have been involved in this enormous effort to distribute the vaccine and ask you to especially bless all who have volunteered their time and talents to the worthy goal of eventually vaccinating the world's population against this potentially deadly virus. Lord, we pray a blessing upon Jessica, a friend of Patty's who is undergoing radical surgery for cancer this month. May Jessica be strong in body, mind, and spirit as she faces this enormous alteration to her body. And may her mother stay strong and grounded in your love. And now we pause in these moments to acknowledge your glory, confess our sins, recall our blessings, and raise our petitions to your throne. May glory, honor, and power be forever yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm
And now, may the one who is able to keep us from falling and to lift us from the dark valley of despair to the bright mountaintop of hope be with you in this day and in all the days that are to come. Amen. <laughs>